Welcome again to the fourth installment of Computer Objects and Object Oriented Programming. Um, if you look, there is a link there for tinyurl, and with that link, you can download this presentation. So let's just go ahead and start. We're going to start by a little encore of our terminology. We said that terminology is very important. If you look at everything on the list there, the stuff in yellow has already been covered in parts one, two, and three. It's a whole lot of stuff. Data types, recursion, constructors, encapsulation, inheritance, instances, blah, blah, blah. That's a lot of stuff to cover in uh, less than an hour. So don't be discouraged. This is an introduction and this is very similar to learning a brand new language. So what we're going to do is create an example with the stuff that we've learned. Okay, here we go. Let's suppose that you work for a company that creates onboard diagnostic scanners like the one that uh, is shown there on the picture. And you're a programmer and you're tasked <coughs> to create a um, an object, a routine that will read the dashboard gauges of the customers. Of course, you don't know the year, the make, and the model that the customer is going to have because your scanner is supposed to read from any car. Luckily, there is a standard, and let's just say that the gauges all have a method called read now, and they have a constant called name. And I want you to think, is that an example of inheritance or encapsulation? So you start your task and you have a demo car in the parking lot and there's the picture of the dashboard. And as you can see, the Spanish uh, words in the middle, so the dashboard is set to Spanish. It's reading in miles miles an hour and degrees Fahrenheit for exterior temperature, but it reads degrees centigrade for water temperature. So the application programmer's interface, the information that you get from the, basically the company that sets the standards, is there just underneath the dashboard. And it says not only about the read now method and the name constant, but it also says that the gauges are listed in a tuple called gauge set of an object called dashboard. So I'd like you to hit pause and just read what's going on there at the bottom of the screen and uh, go ahead and do that for a second. That way you can see what's going on. Okay, and we're back. Hopefully you read what it said. And now I'm just going to summarize it for you. There's an object called dashboard. There's a constant tuple called gauge set. Each gauge has two attributes that we are interested in, the read now and the name. And hopefully you answered encapsulation to the previous question. And just I want you to think, if you didn't get it right, why is it encapsulation? So now we're going to create a pseudocode for this gauge class, okay? And this would be what's going on inside the gauge. And again, I want you to take a look at the bottom right-hand side and uh, hit pause and I'll wait. Okay, and we're back. So one way to do this, if you didn't have object-oriented programming languages, another way, in other words, the way that we used to do this way, way back in the 80s and early 90s, is you would have to read a dashboard gauge set file that would tell you the names and the numbers of gauges that you have. You'd then have to look for each gauge by going through the memory map of the dashboard, you would have to decipher the name, 
you would have to make a list, you'd go through the list, you'd call each gauge by name, you'd ask each gauge its reading, and then you'd hope that you deciphered the list correctly. And that's kind of what the human mind does when it looks at the dashboard and scans left to right. Okay? Now, that's very, very, very complicated. And uh, that's called procedural languages. And in fact, it's so complicated that you'd be surprised how many drivers only understand the fuel and the speed gauge. So, let's take a guess now at an object-oriented programming way to do our task, read and display the value of each gauge, even though we don't know what the car is, we don't know how many gauges it's going to have, or what the gauges say, or what they do. So go ahead and hit pause and try to figure that out, and I shall wait. Okay, we are back. The object-oriented programming way to do this is a whole heck of a lot simpler. The dashboard object has a list that points to all the objects that run the gauges. And we already know this because they told us it was called gauge set. That list could be of any length. Maybe there's only two gauges. Maybe there's 50 gauges. What do I know? But we don't really care how long it is, okay? The list starts and ends so we just go through the list read now and name are encapsulated in each gauge we don't really need to know or care about anything else in the gauge how it works who made it it doesn't matter we simply call the method wait for the answer and then display the gauges name the value and the units with a method that we are creating called display gauges or maybe that method was written by somebody else it doesn't matter and if we wanted to get fancy, we could, you know, convert the units to imperial or U.S. units. Now remember that self is the Python way of saying my. So if you look at the bottom right-hand corner there, you're defining a method called read gauges. Then you're, set, then you're creating a loop with the for keyword. So for a gauge in dashboard dot gauge set so we're gonna cycle through the list called gauge set every time we cycle through the list whatever is in that list is going to be placed in our temporary variable called a gauge the next line down is value and units now that's a tuple right those are two immutable numbers or actually one's a number one's going to be a string equals a gauge dot read now so we send that command we wait for the gauge to tell us and then we use my display gauges procedure that maybe someone else wrote we don't really care but we know that that procedure requires that we send it a string name the numeric value and the string unit and that's it so you could do this technically, theoretically, with one, two, three, four, five lines of code. Much, much easier than a procedural method. So now the OBD2 scanner people that we work for, they figure out that they can sell a $100 upgrade on the scanner. And it has a lot of new features, but one of them is that the mechanic can display the readings on imperial units or as displayed in the dash. Now before object-oriented programming, you would have to look through the thousands and thousands of lines of code, find the appropriate lines of code and modify them for this upgrade. But now you're left with two nearly identical pieces of code that you had to maintain and you had to keep up to date because you were selling two versions of this product. And that, back in the 90s, was a big, big bummer. So let's see what we would do now. We use this thing called polymorphism or overloading. If you notice in our list of words that we defined, this is not one of the words that we had already spoken about. And this is where overloading comes in. Now we previously previously created a class called read car gauge values, okay? 
you would now create a new class that inherits from that masterpiece of yours. And maybe this one is called read car gauge values change units. All the methods, all of the methods from before are inherited. So if anything changes in those methods, you're going to inherit them. So you don't have to care, worry about maintaining them or anything, okay? Very particularly, it may be implemented or changed by someone else. You may not even know a change occurred. But anyway, this one has a method with the same name as before called read gauges. Now this new method includes an extra couple of lines to convert the readings to imperial units if that's what the mechanic wants. You write a new method that did not exist before called make us and it accepts the value and the units as an input looks at the conversion blah blah and just you know and gives you back the us version of the metric units so the extra cost software the hundred dollar extra simply creates an instance of this new class but calls the exact same method read gauges and here is an example of what read gauges could possibly look like. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause. Okay, and we're back. So the summary for overloading is that a class redefines a method that it has already inherited. And this new method is going to run instead of the inherited method. Now the pros of this is that of the hundreds and thousands of lines of the previous class, you don't have to do anything, you don't have to copy them, and they don't change. And when there is a change, you inherit those changes. Because again, your class is a subclass of the, of the you know, previous one or older one. And so I'm going to give you an example of the biology here. Almost all mammals bear live young. Now, maybe in the mammalia class, there is a method called giving birth, and it has instructions for, you know, getting out of the uterus and sliding down the birth canal or what have you. However, enter the platypus and the echidnas. These are the only um, egg-laying mammals in the world that we know of that still exist. So their giving birth method would be overloaded with polymorphism and they would have an instance of mammal with eggs. That's what they would be. They would be mammal with eggs as opposed to say my dog which is an instance of just mammal. And they would be a subclass of mammal. Everything would be inherited except that one method but it would still be called giving birth so that the classes that follow down the line all have to call giving birth. They wouldn't have to call a different method just because the animal in question is a platypus or an, an echidna. By the way, both of these live in Australia. I thought that was very interesting. The platypus, I think, is the strangest animal in the world. So hopefully this explains what polymorphism and overloading is, or at least it gives you an idea. Now you, you have a great time doing this, and uh, I'll see you in the next uh, video.